Before a cell goes to make another cell, it needs to make more DNA because each cell needs a full set of instructions. And that process is DNA replication. You know, back in 1953, when Watson and Crick described what DNA looked like, and came up with a model, something like that, they also described how they thought DNA copied itself. They're pretty dang close. Since then, we've learned a huge amount of information. You could spend an entire class just studying this process. In this video, I just want to touch on the basics. The idea of DNA structure, complementary base pairing, and the enzymes used, at least the major ones. So with that, let's get into it. So here's the chemical structure of a nucleotide. Pretty complicated, huh? Let's break it down because it's not as bad as you might think. So every single one has a phosphate group. And phosphates are things we're going to see again and again. A lot of times, instead of writing all that, we just write a P with a circle around it. Sometimes you'll even see a P with a little I by it, meaning inorganic phosphate. Next, we have this sugar. This one is a deoxyribose sugar. And then finally, the most important part is this nitrogen base. And there are four different nitrogen bases. Okay, so let's look at those four different bases on a slightly different model. Here we're showing the phosphate and the sugar. And then attached to that is a base, one of four nitrogen bases shown over here. I usually just use, instead of adenine, just the A abbreviation. For guanine, it's G, cytosine is C, and thymine is T. Uracil comes into play only with RNA, so we'll come back to that one later. All right, so those are the four monomers that get put together. It'd be like these different colored cups. So this might be the A, and then T could go with that and the G and the C. And they only go together kind of in one direction, but they're all somewhat interchangeable. They just go together in a line. We also can symbolize it when we write it just with the letters. Those sugars and phosphates don't matter a whole lot. So a lot of times we just draw it like this, just those nitrogen bases. Sometimes you'll see it something like this indicating there's that sugar phosphate backbone. And these are the nitrogen bases in the middle. So there would be one of our strands. Let's see what that would look like in a little more realistic chemical perspective. Well, here we see the whole DNA polymer, a little more complicated version of what I drew on the board. Notice, first of all, this spiral pattern, or what we often refer to as the double helix. The main thing this one emphasizes, even though it's really simplified, is these nitrogenous bases. They're shown as these base pairs, the colored sort of rungs on the ladder. And since that's the information coding piece, that's really the most important to us. Kind of like that string of letters I wrote up on the board, but here they're just shown as different colored shapes. This really de-emphasizes the sugar phosphate backbone shows it as kind of like the straight parts on the side of the ladder, but we don't really see much chemistry. Now we could look at the chemistry of the whole thing. And here it is over here, fairly complicated. We got on either side this sugar phosphate backbone and the bases in the middle, if I can emphasize and kind of outline that sugar phosphate backbone, we can kind of see it there. That's just like the one over here in that light blue. And on the inside are our nitrogen bases, the information coding pieces. So there's the DNA double helix. Let's zoom in on the details of how these two strands go together, focusing on complementary bases or complementary base pairing. So DNA is double stranded. Here I have an orange and a white strand together. So here's the detail of the orange strand the white strand is actually really predictable because, as you noticed on those other diagrams, there's always one nitrogen base opposite the other one. 
And so the one opposite here is its complementary base. And the rules for that are simple. A and T always go together, and G and C always go together. I like to think of it as straight line letters go together and curvy line letters go together. So these aren't matching, they're complementary. Kind of like certain shirts go with pants. This might be one outfit and this is a different outfit, but you can't really mix and match them. So let's apply it to this. Complementary to A is T, and complementary T is A. Now that you got that, you can probably do the rest yourself. This is pretty simple. There you go. That's it. We already know what the other strand is going to be. And this actually suggests how DNA copies itself. Well, so far we know what. It involves nucleotides. We know when, right before cell division. We know where, wherever the DNA is. For us, that's in our nucleus. And now on to how. How does this happen? I'm going to give you a bit of a preview and an analogy for this. DNA replication that copying process is different than ours. So if we had a, a fantastic work of art like this that we wanted to make a copy of, then we would either draw a new copy or we take this, put it in a copy machine and pull out a new copy. But that's not how DNA replication works. So DNA is double stranded, not like this. So, so now we have a document more like DNA. And if we wanted to copy it, first we'd have to pull it apart and just work on one strand at a time. This I would put into the DNA copy machine, and what I'd get out was the other half. It would complete it for me. And I could do the same thing with the other half, put it in the DNA copy machine, and it would give me the other half. Pretty strange. So don't think of it as copying like you would see something and you would copy it down. It's a very different process. Let's take a look. Okay, so let's talk about the process of semi-conservative replication. And this is just the basics. There's a lot more detail we can get into, but I want to start here. First, we need to unwind and unzip the DNA, and that's done by the enzyme helicase, or helicase. You see that happening right here, where it's simply split apart. So that's kind of the unzipping. But remember, this is a double helix, and that spiral needs to be unwound as well. So helicase and sometimes other enzymes are involved in that. Then the most important part that we've been emphasizing, we have to add complementary bases, and that's done by the, D, uh, the enzyme DNA polymerase. Its name makes sense. It makes DNA polymers. So that's the enzyme that does that. And here you see it in action here. We don't see the enzyme itself in there, but it is bringing in these complementary bases and adding them into a chain so that in the end, they're all bound together covalently and they stay together. That's it. Really simple. Complementary base pairing. And now we have two strands of DNA identical to the one we started with. And so that's the replication side of things. What do we mean by semi-conservative? Well, we did the replication. Conservative means we conserved one strand. So this original strand is conserved, it's kept down here. And this strand is conserved on the other one over here. But it's only semi-conservative because we built a new strand here. So only half of each strand of DNA, each new strand, is the original actual piece of DNA. So semi-conservative replication kind of tells you how it's done. Just like Watson and Crick had theorized when they came up with the structure of DNA itself. So there's the basics of DNA replication. Not too hard. DNA copies itself using complementary bases. That's a good foundation for you to start from. Make sure you understand this before you move on. I've not tried to animate any of this. There's so many great animations out there for you on the web. I've given you some links to them. Um, take a look at those. It, it does make it come to life a little bit more understanding how this works. It's an amazing process and it happens every time before your body makes a new cell. 
Now we could fill up books and books of information on the rest of the details. In the next video, I'll add a few more enzymes and a little more detail onto the rest of the process because it is a little more complicated than just what I presented here. But this is a solid foundation. My suggestion is before you move on to that video that you try explaining it for yourself. Write out a short paragraph describing this. Explain it to a friend. Make sure that you have the foundations down before you move on. Until next time, keep being amazed by the intricacies of life.